Okay, uh, we're going to begin our next lecture, which goes into the topic of species and changes in the population to warrant considering something a new species. Um, so this is an important concept when we're looking at gene pools, genetic makeup of populations, and considering changes that can occur in these populations and when changes uh, warrant classifying something in another group like a species. So we start by kind of defining uh, species as a, a group of organisms that can breed only among themselves. That's kind of a, a basic biological definition that um, you, you should have learned back in, in bio one. And um, so that's our general definition is that breeding and producing fertile offspring is what qualifies um, organisms to be within the same group. Now, Linnaeus was the um, first to kind of coin this term, and um, he used basically the physical characteristic, not really the breeding ability, but how organisms looked. He would look at them and say, this looks like this, so it would go in the same group. We still use that method today, but breeding and fertile offspring, producing fertile offspring has uh, been the biological concept of what a species is. Um, but Linnaeus really gave us the field of grouping and naming things. He um, uh, developed most of that. But breeding alone and physical characteristic alone um, are not the best criteria for naming and grouping things. Here's a couple of examples. These are two meadowlark birds uh, where they look very similar, uh, and but they cannot breed. They do not breed and produce fertile offspring. They're uh, different locations, but they also um, have some developments that prevent them from uh, breeding and producing offspring with each other. But so they are considered two different species, although they look very similar. So physical appearance uh, is not the best uh, there. But we also have the other case uh, where we have a lot of variation within the same species. Your book mentions humans as an example of that. We're all the same species. We can produce fertile offspring, uh, but there's a lot of variation. You can um, just look around your classroom and see the variation within the human population. So for that reason, um, uh, you know, you have um, the same species with a lot of variation, and sometimes you have organisms that look very similar, but they cannot breed. So, um, so that is why we have our, our concept where breeding is the primary um, uh, concept for um, grouping things, but there are problems with that as well. There's exceptions to that. Um, there's um, like coyotes, domestic dogs, and wolves. These um, are separate species, but they are able to produce and pro um, to produce fertile offspring. Uh, another um, issue with breeding criteria for grouping and naming things, that does not help us with bacteria. Bacteria are asexual. They divide, they reproduce by dividing. And um, so breeding can't be a criteria uh, for naming species in, the, uh, ba in bacteria. Uh, also, extinct animals like dinosaurs, when we examine dinosaur bones and things like that, the uh, fossils, uh, we don't know anything about the breeding and ability to produce fertile offspring. So that would be um, a problem with that type definition. So because of that, biologists have set up different types of concepts for grouping and naming species. Morpho morphological is, is the morphology, the physical characteristics. Um, so that's certainly uh, part of the concept. Um, ecological would be kind of its role in the ecosystem, producer, consumer, decomposer, that type thing, and then where it falls in the food chain. And uh, also there's a phylogenetic species concept, which is um, making inferences about relationships between species and things like that through a lineage. 
So all of these are, are um, different ideas or concepts for naming and grouping uh, different species. Now there are um, instances when um, species have diverged from, or, or individuals have diverged um, uh, away from each other within the same species group and then been considered two distinct species. And so that's a process that we call speciation. All right, so there's different types of speciation. Uh, we'll look at both of these. One is represented in this example here of these ground squirrels. So here we have this ground squirrel represented by A is the genus period and then Harissi is the genus, uh, the species. A uh, is the genus period and then Lycurus is the species. These are two different species of the same genus, ground squirrels. They look very similar, so if we were going on physical appearance alone, we would probably group them as the same species. But they've been separated from one another for a long period of time. Their separation is this barrier, the Grand Canyon. One's found on one side of the canyon, one's found on the other. And they don't breed with each other. They can't navigate the canyon and they, they do not encounter. And so they have become genetically distinct, isolated from one another. And their gene pool has become distinct. And they've been separated long enough to be considered a new species. And so the uh, idea is that at one time before the canyon, these were uh, the same species, or maybe they were on one side and a uh, few traveled to the other side and developed a new, spe a new species over there. So that type of speciation is called allopatric, when there's this geographical divide that takes place there, when there's something separating them from one another. There's another uh, example called Sympatric and um, sympatric is when um, differences arise within the population, and these differences are such that they no longer reproduce with the parent population. Here's an example of a graph showing allopatric and, and sympatric in these um, uh, in these evergreen uh, trees here. So this is our original population. Again, a barrier, a canyon here to separate those over a period of time. We have some dis differences becoming um, apparent in the genetic makeup of the population, color of the pine needles. All right, so that, that occurs that from that barrier. So that's allopatric. In this case, original population, we have a few pop up here that have some different um, fur color here on these fir trees. The, the needles have different color and they had popped up within the population. So maybe they have a recessive gene or something like that. And if they are such that they no longer can cross fertilize with these original trees here, then that can be considered a new species. This is the most common type of speciation, allopatric, but this can happen uh, especially through mutations or something that occurs that causes a loss of genetic information, um, but especially if it's on the X or Y chromosome where it no longer can um, um, cross fertilize or breed with the parent population. Okay, um, now these are speciation events. When there's a case where there's a lot of speciation events happening rapidly, that's what we refer to as uh, adaptive radiation. So the example of the uh, finches that we talked about in the Galapagos Islands, Darwin's finches, that would be considered adaptive radiation. Um, we have individuals that leave a mainland, uh, go over to an island. If food's available there, they stay there. If they have the right beak size, if not, they move to another one. Over a period of time, you have a number of populations that become established on each island, depending on the food source. And if they remain isolated for a long enough period of time, they can be considered a new species. Okay, the uh, next thing we want to talk about are barriers. We mentioned that allopatric speciation requires a barrier to separate, but there's also these barriers are uh, also good at keeping the species isolated so they can create the separation 
but then they also maintain that separation. So this maintaining the separation between species, these types of barriers are called reproductive barriers. All right, so they're gonna keep that species isolated or separated from the other species. There's different types of these, and that's what we're gonna look at next. Uh, the different types of these barriers um, are categorized based on whether they have been prior uh, to the sperm and egg uniting between two different species or after the sperm and egg unite to form the zygote between two different species. All right, so we call these prezygotic barriers and postzygotic. So pre would be before the zygote forms. The zygote is the fusing of the sperm and egg. And then the postzygotic would be after the zygote form. So in these cases, we have had two different species. They've mated with one another and they have produced a zygote, but these are still barriers that are going to keep a new um, species from arising. All right. So we're going to start. We're going to go through these one at a time. The first one we're going to look at is temporal isolation. So temporal isolation refers to time isolation. This would be when um, animals are encountering each other at different times or they breed at different times. If it's a plant, it may be flowering at different times. So this different time uh, production um, <clears throat> is going to prevent two different groups from, from mating and reproducing with one another. The next one is habitat or ecological isolation. This is when two different, two similar animals may live in the same place, but they they incorporate different niches in that habitat. So they live in different areas within that habitat. Behavioral isolation. This would be some type of behavior that would um, only attract species uh, mates of that species. So cer certain animals have behaviors that they go through that um, would only be attractive to others in that species. <clears throat> Mechanical isolation. This would be when there's gen um, uh, morphological differences. So this would be when there's just differences in the genitalia or differences in the flowers for um, reproduction so that that can't occur between two different species. <clears throat> and then the last one there is gametic isolation. This is when mating does occur between two different species, but they do not produce an offspring because the sperm and egg just are not compatible with one another. Okay, <clears throat> so those are all prezygotic barriers. The last category is postzygotic barriers. And there's really uh, three different types, or sometimes it can be just stated in two different types. And that is, uh, these are barriers that happen after mating has occurred and after a zygote has occurred. So you have two different species, they mate, they produce a zygote, but that zygote is the sperm and egg are close enough to unite, but they're not uh, genetically compatible enough for that zygote to go through embryonic development. So it dies early on. So it's um, either a reduced uh, hybrid viability or hybrid infertility, but they cannot um, um, go through embryonic development. And then the last one is hybrid sterility. And this is when uh, mates of two different species mate and produce an offspring, but it's a hybrid that is sterile and cannot produce uh, a, um, uh, another mate. And so an example of that would be like the um, uh, horse and the mule. They can produce, they're two different species, they reproduce and they produce an offspring, which is the donkey. But the donkey is sterile, and um, so that's an example of hybrid sterility. All right, uh, and that's where we end. The next topic that we're going to look in the next podcast goes into more of the historical uh, evolution story and talking about fossils and interpretation of those fossils.